a little bit about uh, some of the things that we didn't have a whole lot of time to talk about last class. And primarily, we're looking at uh, different ways of dealing with an accumulation of errors that could be associated with tolerance stackups or part variance stackups as a result of assembling multiple parts on top of each other and not being able to tightly control the variance uh, or the tolerance or just wanting to be able to allow for a larger variance or a larger tolerance than is offered in whatever manufacturing process that we are currently using. Um, the first thing I want to note as a design parameter is that we can use is intentional under constraint of the system. So a lot of times we're putting things together with things like pins, which are gonna define the position of two components relative to each other in both an X and Y direction. Think about, is there a way that I can relieve a portion of that constraint? The typical way of doing that would be to use a slot. And that would allow us to constrain just one direction. And we can even more creative with that. We can look at half slots that constrain the relationship between the X and Y. So if you want a variance in a certain direction to correspond with a certain other parameter inside the model, you can incorporate that into the design by essentially making that into like a cam, right? Where the pin has to follow some path between the components. It doesn't have to be just in the X and the Y. If you want to, you can also just make the hole, right, around a pin bigger and then that's going to allow for more variance in both directions. And that's what we're talking about with allowances, right? So if I just make for a larger gap between components, then that will allow for more variance in both directions. And if we're worried about aesthetics, we can always put a cover or some kind of aesthetic component over the top of that mechanical connection to kind of hide the accumulation of error that we might see in a manufacturing process. A lot of times that cover might have a separate rig that holds it in place that keeps the gaps and the spacing kind of in place uh, until these things are all kind of set in place. So if you're looking at manufacturing a car body, you might use something like this, where all the structural components are put into place and then the body panels are put on top of that and the positioning of the panels can be set such that the variance that's accumulating with the individual components of the frame are not adding to an additional variance from the panels themselves, right? So we can compensate for any errors by using an external fixture for the aesthetic components relative to the functional components. Um, we can also use adjusting things that allow for us to set the position independent of what the manufacturing component is. So dials, screws, uh, anything like that it allows us to adjust the component to get it just in the right position. And then we can fix it in place using a tertiary component. So usually a screw or a key something like that, it's gonna hold those two pieces together once they're at whatever position that we want, right? Um, typical example, kind of like that, you have like, you know, a, a, a tripod that has an adjustment where you don't know what the actual height you want it's going to be. You can't manufacture an infinite number of heights and so you make some kind of collar on that that allows you to adjust the sizing. Or even like a call it chuck for like your drills. Again, you want it to be exactly the right size for the bit. You don't know what size bit you're gonna use and so you allow for adjustment in that design. Um, Typically, these are adding complexity to your design, so they will add some cost, and so you got to figure out whether or not the cost of the additional features in your design is going to be compensated for by the reduced manufacturing cost of the components, right? The other thing that you can use besides using design changes um, is just the idea of allowing for the components to be compliant, and two common ways of doing this. One, you can just have softer materials. So if I have softer materials, they can be more resilient to errors in manufacturing sizes. So I can force things to fit together if they're soft, just by pressing them together. Um, if they're very stiff, then I may have to use spring, springs, which is anything where I use a long, thin geometry to allow for compliance, right? So a spring is just usually a, a helical bar. And the reason I use a helical bar is I can make a very long bar in a small space by making it into a helix. You had a, a long bar and then we're just going to move the end of it, it would bend just like the spring was, but it would take up a lot of space. So I just coil it around that deformation so it gets compressed. So if I have two components that have to maintain a certain fitting relative to each other, I can put a spring on the end. It's going to hold those two components in contact and then the variance won't matter as much. So if all I care about these being fixtured and kept and hold, held in place, 
or if I only compare about kind of maintaining the one edge, then having a spring inside the system can be beneficial. You also see springs used a lot in different types of uh, non, um, I want to say non-mechanical fasteners is not, not technically direct, but whenever you're trying to replace screws and bolts with integrated components, integrated fasteners, like clips. And so if I have an arm that comes off the side right here, that arm is going to be fairly flexible. And so I can force it down into this component. It'll bend back this way, go through. Then once it's gone through, it'll clip out and it'll stay in position. You don't have to use that for just clips, but you can use that for any time you want to put two components and have them stay together or have them use up the spacing between the two of them to allow for variance. So I can make a part soft by doing that. And then it doesn't have to be the right size. It's gonna automatically adjust itself to whatever size it needs to be to use up the gap, right? And that's what it allows us to. It allows us to make those parts fit together by themselves aligning themselves. And it's gonna save us time. Yeah, yeah. So plastics are pretty elastic, um, like PLA and ABS. They will withstand a reasonable amount of deformation before they have a permanent plastic deformation. And so you can print stuff like this pretty easily. Yeah, yeah so like a living hinge. So a, a living hinge is really just whenever you have a very thin wall that is... Uh, it a, has a significant amount of elasticity that it doesn't, usually they have some plastic deformation, but they have a small enough plastic deformation that they don't fatigue over a reasonable lifespan. And you can replace a hinge with just a thin wall, right? So a typical example for that is like the cap to a shampoo bottle, right? If you pop it open, it opens up. There's no pin there. It's just a thin flap, right? But you can print that. You typically have to use a single wall thickness and it's going to have a limited lifespan. So it's only going to last for, you know, 100,000 cycles or something. But yeah, you can print them, they work fine. Um, another thing you do with living hinges is that living hinges will also act like a spring. So if you make them thicker, they will resist that deformation. And so you can design them to not only be hinges, but also be springs. Um, but that requires some calculation to figure out what the difference between the working position and the print position is gonna be, because they're gonna be different, right? Yeah, well, you do that. So if you wanted to print like a wrench, that's all one piece, yeah. you can do that, yeah. With mechanical advantage and everything, yeah. yeah. And those designs on there, you can download them. Print them. Yeah, I was, I was the, so the problem if you're trying to like print a living hinge wrench is that the the jaws of the wrench itself are too soft. So if you had a wrench that was just like regular wrench, it was all made out of plastic, and you used it to try and turn a bolt. It's going to constantly want to slip because the jaws of the wrench will actually deform as you're trying to turn it. So if you wanted that to be functional, you'd probably have to replace the actual like teeth of the wrench with something harder so it could resist that rotation. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. It also wouldn't last very long because it would constantly be running out. So. If, you're only, if you're doing it for light duty stuff or very large bolt sizes, it's probably okay. Small bolts, it doesn't work. All right. So I'm gonna put up a, uh, that's the wrong page, move the next page. This one, I'm gonna show this PDF. And I want you all just to look at this for a few minutes and write down a list of things that you think are wrong with this drawing. You guys can include this in your submission for the in class report this week. You do it in a Word document, you want to do it on your iPad, whatever. List out as many things as you can that are wrong or bad or whatever you want to call it with this drawing. I need this full screen. It's as full screen as it gets, I guess.
probably enough time. Laura, can you give what's one thing that you see is wrong or bad about this drawing? Doesn't include any tolerance or variances, so I don't know what the accuracy that is needed for any of these components. That's a pretty big thing that I should include on my drawing. Kaylin, what's one thing that you said that's missing from this drawing? Or bad, I didn't know they you'd be missing. Also, what was something else? <laughs> you think that one thing? Oh my goodness. You guys are really focused on tolerances. Oh, and how about you? What's that? Oh yeah, so I don't have a like this portion right here. I've got no radius here, right? Yeah, so I'm incomplete dimensions, right? And I don't include all the values that I need for that. That's good. So you got the tolerances and the lack of the the round on the end of the drawing here. Anything else? Wait, what about the Right here? Yeah. Yeah. So there's also around there that's missing a dimension. Over to find? Good. How's it over to find? We just shown twice. And then it's given big, like all this. This one here, this two? Oh, yeah, those two. And then like the one. This like, one the one here is, is not necessarily with this one because I can have this distance. Value in this radius, right? What was the other one you said? Uh, well, it's same as 0.5 and it's 1.5. I think it's 0.5, but it's 1.5. Which one? This is a diameter of 0.5. I'm uh, not sure I'm the, seeing which other one you're talking about. This distance here? Yeah, yeah it's the one next to it. This the one by so this is the distance for that year and this year, right? Yeah. The, the problem with this is that this is like two, right? Yeah. And this origin is in a strange spot, right? And so one of the problems with this is that this distance here is two. I don't care that that origin is there. What I care about is the fact that the length of this whole thing is two. I don't know how wrong with this dimension with this uh with this drawing. Pedro? What's that thing that's missing from here? I was uh like the orientation of the drawing with the organization. Like the method that you can split off drawings can look better. Yeah, so it's a little bit unintuitive that I have like a, a main view and a right view. I don't have a top view, it's probably okay. I don't know why I have the uh, um, auxiliary view kind of in the middle. Strange. These are using holographic projections, so they are at 90 degrees for each other, so that's not necessarily a huge problem. Um, you know, this one is not telling me a lot of information because I'm sitting at the back of the part, probably at the front of the part. That would be easier to tell what's going on. And where are we going to no units, exactly. So not only do I not have any annotations, I don't know what units the system is, right? If I were to assume units for this, this is in inches, then these values probably wouldn't be too terrible. But if I look at this, if this is a jaw for some kind of orthopedic component, then probably there are millimeters, right? Because making a five inch jaw for an orthopedic component would be very, very large, right? In terms of this space. Probably this is a small component. If this is a small component, and I assume that this is in millimeters, what's another problem with this going back to you guys' issue with tolerances? We have a separate one? Do we that? It doesn't necessarily show the holes or through holes. That's a great one. There's no known depth for the holes. And since I haven't included a hidden line view or anything on this view, there's no way to indicate that. So a hidden line view would have helped with that, or some indication that those are through all, right? What else? I was talking about the idea of precision and the units that I'm using. If I specify two decimal places in my drawing, 
and it's in millimeters, what would you assume the tolerance is? So standard tolerances are basically just like rounding error. So I would assume that the tolerance that I'm requiring here is like plus or minus 0 0.01 millimeters. Is that an appropriate tolerance? How big is 0 0.01 millimeters? Pretty small, right? 10 micron. So that's probably a very tight tolerance, especially if I'm using that as a global tolerance for every single dimension inside my part, right? Having no, to no tolerance dimensions in a drawing can be forgiven if you're using appropriate global tolerances, and those global tolerances are something that are, appropriate, are reasonable, right? But if you're saying that you have a global tolerance of a hundredth of a millimeter, that's pretty hard to manufacture. And so you're going to be making a very expensive part from negligence, right? So to review, we've got missing dimensions for the radius here, the radius here. We've got uh, some ambiguous depth of the holes. We don't have any tolerances. If we assume a global tolerance, the tolerance is too tight. We don't have any units. Uh, we're missing some other information here. What is this part? I don't know. Doesn't have a name, doesn't have a part number, doesn't have who it was made by doesn't have when it was made, doesn't have what it was made for, right? So typically you need enough information on the drawing to tell what the drawing is, who made it, when it was made, you know, and some other information inside the part itself. So today we're gonna remake this part and we're gonna remake this drawing and we're gonna try and do a better job of drawing it out. And the first thing that I wanna note when we do this is the most important part of making a good drawing is making the part in a way that's intuitive and easy to replicate in the first place. So we're gonna use most of the geometry on here, but we're gonna simplify some of the things. And we're gonna first off pick what we think is an appropriate orient, or sorry, appropriate origin for this part. Now, the reason we have this one one dimension here is because the origin of the part is there at that location which tells us the center of that arc, but maybe that's not the best origin for this part. So if we wanted to pick an origin for this component, what would be probably the best thing to use for that? Maybe I should describe what's happening with this part a little bit more. So this is a, this is a jaw for a surgical grasper. And what's gonna happen with this is that it's gonna fit inside another component some face that was an easier control surface for manufacturing, which is usually like the corner of the part somewhere. This part doesn't have a really good kind of corner center location, maybe the bottom right, but even that's not gonna be an internal corner because all these other components are gonna to have to come off of that. So having that central hole be the starting point on here probably makes sense. So let's draw a kind of an outline of this part with that hole being the central location. open up SOLIDWORKS. I don't even know if I'm sharing screen. I was not. I apologize to the no one who's online and the anyone who watches this video later. I didn't open up SOLIDWORKS. It's like the worst mistake to make in this class is not open SOLIDWORKS at the start of class, right? You know, I just gotta wait forever. 
But while that's loading, let's, let's plan out how we want to draw this part. Um, I will say that whenever I'm designing something for like an actual use, I almost always make the part once and then think about how I want to manufacture that part, even if it's being 3D printed or something. And then I will consider, do I need to make the part again, considering my manufacturing methods and whatever constraints that I have? Most of the time when your primary concern is just getting the geometry down onto the page, you're not considering the workflow that is necessary for making the part appropriately. So don't be afraid to remake parts. And I mean, totally from scratch, right? Because the second time you make it, it'll be better. And even if it's not, it usually doesn't take that long to make something the second time. Making something the first time takes a long time. Second time, a lot faster. Uh, let's make a new part. Right off the bat, we'll make sure we're in the right units. So millimeter gram second. And I'm gonna set my material to stainless steel. So do edit material. And we want a stainless steel bar stock. We'll click apply and then close. So 316 stainless steel, that's good. I'm gonna come to the front plane. I'm gonna sketch on the front plane. Now the front plane, if I sketch on here, that will become the front view kind of by default in my drawing. So I'm kind of okay with the way that is being the front view. I think I might like to have it go to the right rather than the left just because it looks kind of backwards as it is. It doesn't really matter. The advantage of it going to the right is if I go to the right view from the front view is I'll be looking at this kind of from the end down rather from the back down and it'll allow for my layout to be a little bit better. So I'm just gonna draw the outline of this part from that front view or from that kind of inverted front view. Let's do a side by side. That should hopefully work out okay. There we go. So we'll start with the origin on that central circle. I'm gonna give it a diameter of 0.5 quite small, just half a millimeter. I'll get the second circle down below that. It's also gonna have a diameter of 0.5. I didn't specify that in the drawing, looks like. Um, probably because when I did this, I made those two circles equal, which I can do, and that's totally fine. Let's actually go ahead and do that and we'll show you how to fix that annotation in the drawing. So make those two equal. And then I don't have a spacing between these two holes. Um, which probably is not a good idea. If that origin is going to be on that central hole, I want as many of the dimensions as possible to go back to that location. So I am going to go ahead and specify the distance between these two holes. And if I look at my drawing, if they're both a, a half inch in diameter, and this total distance here is one and a half inches, then this one distance here should probably be a one millimeter. And they should probably be vertically aligned. So I'm going to leave the smart dimension tool, click on the center of the first hole, hold control, click on the center of the second hole, and then make them vertical. That looks pretty good. And I'm going to draw this going the opposite direction. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit. I'm just going to go starting from the left side coming down. I'm across. I'm going to try and smart transition to the arc tool just by drawing a little bit of an arc coming off that end. Just come up a little bit. And then I'm going to come back up. And I'm going to go all the way out. And then I'm going to try and arc again upwards. And then I'm going to come back to the start. And I didn't quite end up where I wanted. So I'm going to go into the trim tool. And I'm going to corner trim, put those back together. And then I'm actually going to control Z and undo that and do it all again. So you guys can watch one more time if you'd like. So again, starting on the top left, I'm just coming down, going across. I'm going to try and smart transition to the arc tool, just drawing a little arc. If I don't get it the first time, let's try again. If I don't get it the second time or the third time, then I give up and I'll just draw an arc tool later. Um, I'll do that for the second one. So I'll come up here, across. I'm going to pretend like I can't get the arc tool off of here. And instead, I'm just going to go to a uh, center point arc. 
start at the center there, come down the end, arc up, and then come across. And go back to the line tool. And again, if those two don't line up and I want those to be horizontal and tangent, I'll just use the trim tool, switch to the corner trim. So not the panel trim, but the corner trim. Click on the two lines I want to form the corner and it'll heal that edge close together. Um, I could also, instead of doing that, I could click on the two points, hold control and merge them. It does mostly the same thing, except for it moves the parts around instead of uh, extending the lines. So if you want the lines to stay in the same spot, then use the trim tool and it'll extend the lines. If you don't care, the lines aren't like in the right spot anyways, then use the merge tool and let's move them together. Kind of six one, half a dozen the other. The bar so good? Yeah, so to do the trim one, we use go to trim entities, click on the corner as the option for the trim type, and then click on the two lines you want to kind of fuse together. Um, and it will show you like a little preview. I think when you, right before you click on the second one, so I click on the first one and then I hover over the second one, it shows me what that trim is gonna look like before I click it. Um, and it'll do that for kind of either of the options. You also have these other options for the trim tool. So if you want to do a specific type of trim, rather than just cutting away parts from in between wherever they are, uh, you know, that is a useful thing to have. Feeling good? Let's add some more dimensions to this. I'll set the total length to five millimeters. I'll make it so that the center of these holes is uh, half a millimeter from the back side. I'm trying to use most of the same dimensions I have inside the drawing. I'll make the bottom of the part uh, 1.5 millimeters from the center. Now here, oh, not 0.5, 1.5. You may ask, well, why didn't I use the same 0.5 at the bottom of the part? But again, I'm trying to make as many of my dimensions as possible come back to that center hole position. Um, so far, the only one that I haven't done that for is this total length. And probably because that total length is gonna be much easier to verify as a total length than it would be as a position relative to that center hole. Um, it's also probably less critical than my other dimensions. And so I might wanna start adding uh, tolerances to some of these if I know what they are. And there's generally two ways of adding tolerances to uh, the parts. You can do it in the actual drawing itself. So I can come into here, specify a uh, tolerance type and then specify the parameter. So maybe it's 0 0.06 millimeters, right? Which you say, oh, well, maybe that is too much, but it's a lot bigger than 0 0.01, right? So how big is sufficiently small, sufficiently big, depends on the tolerance of the parts you're making. In this case, if I'm putting a 0.5 millimeter rod through a 0.5 millimeter hole, I probably can't afford to have a 0.1 millimeter tolerance. I probably don't want to try and enforce a 0 0.01 millimeter tolerance. So probably 0 0.02, 0 0.03 is something that's kind of appropriate. Now, if I know my rod is going to be exactly 0 0.05 plus or minus 0 0.01, I might want to add an allowance to that or make a bilateral tolerance. Your machinist will hate you if you make bilateral tolerances, by the way. So if you think that you want to do something like, um, let me go back to this hole and say bilateral and say, well, I'll just make it, you know, five plus six minus zero. Don't do that, right? That's the same tolerance if you were to just say 5.3 and then make it symmetric and make it 0 0.03. That tolerance is way better than 0 0.5 minus zero plus 0 0.06 because now the part basic size is in the middle of the tolerance zone and the machinist doesn't have to remake your part so that the tool path hits the middle of the tolerance zone, right? If you remember back to a few lectures ago, we talked about doing the, uh, this, the cam pathing, right? All the pathing for the cam is gonna be based off of the size of the part in the model. And so if you have a bounding tolerance that is basically a zero tolerance on one side of the basic side, you're never going to hit that. 
So your machinist has to go in and manually edit that path or manually kind of do some finishing operations allowing for the roughing pass in the first place or remake your model in SOLIDWORKS with the geometry in the middle of the range. Does that make sense? I'm not gonna put all the tolerances on here. Most of the time, I would not put tolerances at this stage in the design. I would put them in the drawing or I would use the, the DIM expert tool like we did last time when we did the tolerance stack up. Because honestly, when I'm making the part, I don't necessarily know what the tolerances are. The advantages of doing it in this way is that you can change the base size of the parts even in just the drawing. So if I make the drawing, I can still change the size of the parts. Um, once I go to the DIM expert tool, I'm no longer able to modify the base sizes of the parts. The disadvantage of this is that I can't use gd &T. Like I can't use gd &T on the sizes of the features themselves. So, um, so I can't specify all the different like size and shape constraints that you would have for linearity or smoothness or angularity um, that we have available to us in gd &T. Uh, Long tangent aside, uh, the distance from the center here to the top of this arc is going to be, uh, what is that going to be? It's going to be interesting. Um, trying to do some mental math here. Probably this is 0.5 as well. So that total distance should probably be like two. I might make that oversized and then just come back and edit it. Let's do it from the middle. Oh, hit escape on accident. Sorry, y'all. Let's set this to maybe 2.5. Mm, maybe just two. I'm trying to think what that size would be. I think this should be 0.5. That looks okay. This is a little cluttered. I'm just trying to clean it up a little bit. If I can position my, my dimensions in kind of a good spot to begin with, I'm going to save time later on putting them down. Total width here should be one. I do want this arc and this arc to be concentric. So I'm going to leave the smart dimension tool, click on those two arcs, make them concentric. Same thing here, I'm gonna click on this arc and this arc, so those two arcs there, make them concentric. Oh, doesn't like that. Uh, oh, because I have the center of this arc coincident on this line, so I need to delete that relation. Now it's okay. So if you get complaints that the relations are not good, yeah, I don't think this is what we do, I think it should be 1.5. This looks too tall. That looks much better. It also looks much more symmetric now, which would make sense, right? If I'm putting this inside of a component that it has some symmetry top to bottom as well as uh, kind of left to right. Questions on that so far? I'm pretty good about that. This part is probably one of the few examples where I might actually try and do two sketches or two ex different extrudes from one sketch. Um, that's something I generally do not have uh, what I would call amateur SOLIDWORKS users do. But for the sake of learning a new thing and talking about more diversely, we're gonna do it in this example. So this is where I would normally stop and go on to the next part. If you want to try and save time and not having to redraw and convert entities, one thing that you can do is you can actually use the same sketch multiple times for extrudes. It makes it a little bit less resilient to changes down the line, but if you're making a secondary part and you've already determined most of the specifications, like we are in this case, where we're making a part from a part, um, it's okay. So I'm gonna go back into trim and go to extend entities. And I'm gonna extend this line out. You guys see what that happened there? So trim, 
We can also come down here to, uh, actually, no, I need to do the outgoing. So do extend. Now, if I click on this line here, it's a little hard to see because the dimension's in the way. Let me try and move this dimension out of the way. So I'm going to do extend entities. So I kind of projects that out. Now I have that projected line. I lost my relation there, but I can add it back in pretty easily. So I'm going to make this point so it's coincident on that line again. And now what I would call, I would have what I call a broken sketch. It's no longer a single closed contour. It won't extrude just normally. But what I can do is I can go into features, extrude boss base. I'm still going to do both these with the mid plane. And then I can select the contour I want to use for the extrusion. So I have the first one here. This is going to have a width of one millimeter, accept. And then go back into my sketch, click on that, click on extrude boss base, click on the other contour, make it a mid plane, give it a width of two millimeters. And now I've gotten closer to my final geometry without having to do extra steps. Let me show you guys that one more time. So again, I have a sketch with two closed contours that are going to extrude to two different heights. The features extrude boss base under selected contours. You can pick on the first contour. It doesn't matter which order you do them in. Set the mid plane, set the width, except inside the feature, you have the sketch again. Click on that, click on extruded boss base. What's that, Martha? For what? To get the sketch again? So the first one, I used this first contour at the bottom. So I went to selected contours and clicked on the region at the bottom of the sketch and gave it a width of one millimeter. For the second part, I go back into the sketch, which is going to be hidden underneath the boss extrude. Click on the sketch, click on extruded boss base, then I click the top portion, again, make it a mid plane and give it a width of two millimeters. The problem with this is that the region of the sketch that you select is going to be dependent on the size of the part. So if I change the size of the part and those regions move, SOLIDWORKS might not be able to recognize which region is which anymore. So when you're going to be varying the size of the part, like you have a parameter of your own part or something like that, don't do this. Just don't do it. If you have a part that's not parameter parametrically different, um, and it's got lots of different kind of depths off the same view, like off the same front view, then it makes sense to do something like this to save yourself some time. Sound good? All right. Uh, let's go out now and cut off the top of this. So I'm gonna go to the right plane on the sketch. I'm going to do a uh, half or a quarter circle or an arc. So let's go to the arc tool. Let's do center point arc. We come down here to below my origin. Uh, I went the wrong way. I'm just gonna circle back the other way. I'm gonna make an arc that just goes across the top half of that. I actually don't wanna go all the way across. If I go all the way across, then SOLIDWORKS is likely to give me a zero point thickness error because the very top edge won't cut out. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut this top edge off uh, with a single cut extrude using this one line, and then I'm going to mirror it. And it should work out okay. If not, I can try something else. Uh, I do want this center arc to be vertical below my origin, and it's going to be located a half of a centimeter, half a millimeter down from that origin. So I should put it in the middle of this bottom section. And if I want to check that, I can always make a driven dimension that kind of shows that size. So this is the case where you have some redundant dimensions. Um, you might wanna have redundant dimensions inside your drawings. You should annotate which ones are redundant. And in this case, because I have kind of a light gray and the dark gray, it's somewhat obvious, but I would add additional ad annotation to this. So something like this. You might also say reference, right? Reference dimension, just ref. 
Again, different companies are going to have different standards for how they want you to annotate those things. That's the kind of thing you'll pick up, you know, um, after you work there for a little bit. I'm going to cut extrude this. I'm going to do through all. Oh, wrong side. Flip side to cut. That's much better. I'm going to show that one more time just so you guys can see it. So just one sketch. It's just the arc. It has to go from the edge of the part to the edge of the part. And once I've got that sketch inside the cut extrude, all I'm doing is through all. And then pay attention to which side of the part you're keeping and which side you're throwing away. If you get it wrong. Um, it's pretty obvious. And it's pretty easy to flip. So that kind of single line cut extrude is helpful. And I'm just going to mirror that across the uh, front plane, I guess. Uh, mirror. You get a nice smooth top. It doesn't say what the radius um, of the top of this one is on this sketch either, but I can probably assume that based off the geometry, uh, I want a smooth radius across the top. And so the radius should be half of the width. So I probably want a one millimeter radius on each of these front edges as well. So I'm just gonna add a fillet to that, to the one millimeter and click on both sides. You notice I get a nice smooth transition across the top of that. Make sense? And then I need to add the uh, ribs or the knurling on the inside of the jaw. And so I'm just gonna come to the, um, the edge of the, of the top of the, what do you even call it? The tip over here. I'm just gonna draw a triangle. And you notice it has a width of 0.2. So I'm just gonna use an equilateral triangle kind of going across the tip here. And one of the things that I'll want to do with the annotation here is I probably want to specify that this is just a knurling. And I don't really care what the size of this is. So I got that one triangle. We're going to do an extruded cut with that. Again, we're just going to do through all in both directions. And then I'm going to take that cut and I'm going to linear pattern it down the edge. Use the same spacing as I have for the size of the base. So all of them line up just nicely. And we'll as many, we have 20 of them. 20. You see they all line up just perfectly. So that's the part. Um, again, drawings start with making the part in a way that makes sense. The drawing is going to come very quickly from this now that we've defined the things we want them to find. I'm going to save this. I'm just going to call it jaw. Maybe jaw one. I'll put it into a week 10 folder. Save that. And then I'm gonna do a new drawing from part. If you don't have all the parameters of the part done at this point, don't worry about it. Just save the part, make the drawing, put in the annotations that you have for the features that you have. You can go and you can add more of the other features later. I'm more concerned that you guys are kind of paying attention, getting some of the concepts that we're covering um, and learning some of the, the philosophy behind here. I. Yeah. So it has a dimension. The dimension is set by the height of that radius. What I'm going to do is in the drawings, I'm going to add additional callouts to specify the radius of that curvature. But I'm going to say that's for reference because it's going to be concentric with the other part, right? And I'm also going to say this is concentric with center hole, right? Or concentric with pivot hole. Again, that's what we're going to come out here. So um, 
I'm going to start with the front view. I'm going to pull out a right view as well. And then I do like having the orthographic view. I'm not sure where I want to put it. I think right there is probably fine. One of the things about the orthographic view is that you don't have to leave it where it was. I also don't have to keep the default view. So I can change this to whatever view I want um, inside this drawing view options here. Uh, I guess I'm okay with that. I want to move it a little bit more out of the way though. And I'm going to change it to, rather than just being a line view, I'm just going to make it like that. I might also make it a slightly smaller scale than the other parts. This is okay. It's a little bit smaller than it needs to be. So I might use a custom scale, um, maybe 20 to one. Nah, that's too small. 50 to one, that's too big. Let's use 30 to one, that looks okay. So right off the bat, start off with a note. Uh, you wanna say this is a clamp. Wait, what size drawing am I using? This is way too huge. Uh, that's the way it's big. Um, there we go. I just changed the sheet size a little bit. It doesn't matter. Making notes, making notes legible. Uh, jaw for surgical clamp. Part number 001815. I'm making up a part number, right? Derek J. Lura, 1024 slash 2020. And starting off, just adding a note, what part this is, what part number it is, those kinds of things, right? To always have something that identifies you and the part. You want to say what the scale of the drawing is? 25 to 1. I don't know why that is like a colon instead of a L, mistyped. You can put that in this other text block. You can put it someplace else. Doesn't really matter. Just always have the scale. You can double click to edit these. You can format them out how you want. Surgical 316 stainless steel. All units in millimeters. Tolerance. Uh, where's my symbols? You are my symbols tools are. I'll just say plus slash minus 0 0.02 millimeters unless otherwise plus five. Yeah, kind of. Again, it's up to you and your manufacturing techniques as to what kind of tolerance you want to specify. Um, two mil, point two, point zero two millimeters is twice as big as 0 0.01 millimeters, right? 0 0.01 millimeters is going to be kind of on the range of what is reasonable with a modern CNC kind of equipment, right? Um, so you don't really want to push the bounds on that. If you can ease that up even just a little bit, it's going to make a big difference. Right. And you can specify what the ranges are. Um, on here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to import my mono annotations. I'm just going to do import into all views for the entire model. I'm going to click on the green check mark. And then I'm going to go around and I'm going to rearrange each of these so that way they are reasonably placed. And then I realize that we're kind of out of time for today. So what we'll do is we will come back to this in class on Wednesday.
to finish that up and to kind of place out some of these a little bit better. Sound good? So save that. And I'm gonna stop the recording for now. You can save it just the same name, it doesn't matter.